Uh, hello there, my name is Rico, and this is going to be a submission video for Pace 2020. I'm going to be submitting any percent for Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone on PS1, also known as Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone uh, on the American version. Uh, so, yeah, let's get right into it. Um... So at the very beginning of the run there's actually this t like two minute cutscene that is unskippable so uh there was nothing about this it's probably the best time to just kind of explain stuff about the game so would soon be happening. uh As unsuspecting muggles slept, this is specifically the playstation one the version the of harry potter and the philosopher's stone uh, because uh, every version of the game is actually different. There's five different versions on five different consoles, uh, and they're all completely different games. There's a Game Boy Color version, a Game Boy Advance version, PlayStation 1, uh, six-gen console, so like PS2, GameCube, Xbox, and there's the PC version. Uh, the PC version is generally the most well-known. Um, it it's like speed-wise and casual-wise, it's the one that most people remember. Uh, but the PlayStation 1 version is very interesting in its own right. It's kind of like a Zelda clone, where it's it's very simple. And it's like uh, it's like a kind of open world, not like sort of. Um, you, you have like kind of free exploration of the castle. And... Uh, it's basically like an action adventure game, more or less. Um, the fastest version of the game, obviously, is NTSC because of just frame rate and such like that. Uh, and then fastest speed, which is standard for most uh, PS1 games on PS2. Alright, so that's the end of the cutscene, and then we have to talk to Dumbledore here before we actually get to start the run. Also, this game is very uh, infamous for its uh, 3D models and the faces on the characters, so it'll be great to observe. Welcome to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. I am Albus Dump. No, oh. All right, so yeah, this game doesn't have much in terms of like movement tech, but there's like a bunch of small tricks that you do across the run that add up. So here, if you just go directly straight and then do a diagonal, you can just jump straight to this charms corridor here, and it saves a bit of time. And then coming up here is the tutorial level. Hey, Harry, remember me, Ron Weasley? That slide. I think it was your. Alright, so the tutorial is like pretty long, but it kind of just gives off the vibe of how the game is in general. Come on, Harry. Well, well, I'm Drake. Looking for go home. Also, because you have to wait a little bit before you can skip dialogue, there's a lot of very hilarious dialogue interactions that happen throughout the run. Come on, Harry. Let's go. Follow me. So in this tutorial, you have to pick up these feathers in every room to unlock the door to the next room. So I'm going to attempt a cutscene skip here. And I missed it, so we're gonna we're gonna attempt it again. There we go. So if I had landed in front of Ron, a cutscene would have started where he talks about the feathers, and then he you have to watch him run back to the entrance. So just grabbing the edge on the side there uh, skips that cutscene. All right. So this room is really tall. Uh, there's some there's some skips you can do generally like Harry grabbing a ledge is a very slow animation like this whereas Jim Harry jumping off of a ledge and then landing is faster so you kind of want to get those as much as you can and you can do a lot of them in this room here but they're pretty tricky and if you fall down then it's a huge amount of time loss so I'm just gonna play some of these really safe but that's an example of being of uh, doing a jump instead of a climb So here we get the uh, the Flapendo knockback jinx. This is Harry's primary form of attack in the entire game. So now, in most rooms, you're not going to see it in here because there's nothing you really have to do in this room besides collect these two feathers. But 
you'll see it here in this next room. You can, if you hit X, you get a like shot that you can do like that. And then just a little bit of time save here. Instead of pushing this all the way to the end, you can just jump and grab the feather like that. Uh, something to know, you actually don't want to kill that rat because it doing so gives you house points. Uh, the game runs on a house point system where, you know, you know, Harry Potter, whoever has the most house points at the end of the year wins the house cup. It's blatantly rigged. It's just like a, it's just like a semantics mechanic. It doesn't actually affect anything. It does affect 100% a little bit, but in any percent, uh, you want to collect as few points as possible because it actually loses frames on these like house point or hourglass cutscenes throughout the game. To have oh, more points. I've lost my Use the R1. But yeah, this is the map action. These books are a little RNG, and this is terrible. Well, that was a terrible book room. The lever is around. Yeah, the, the opening, like, portion of this run is very straightforward, and you basically play the game as intended, but once you get to the outside of the castle, uh, everything changes, so. And then, that was, like, like a charged Flapendo knockback, Jinx. Uh, there are some things where you have to charge up the attack in order to be able to damage them, and charging in general just causes more damage to things that can sustain multiple hits. Yeah, this is the end of the tutorial. Uh, I see you Hi. I nice to meet you. Uh, come on, Harry. Alright, so coming up next is the flying lesson. So there's a cutscene skip you can get here. Let's see if you can get it. So you can like pull ahead of Ron like this. Ah, I didn't get it. If you're fast enough, you can get far enough ahead of Ron that you just reach the door before the cutscene starts. It saves a couple seconds. Alright, so flying shows up pretty often in the run. It's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, you can save a little bit of time in this flying lesson by just going towards the edge of the rings because uh, the less you turn the better so you just want to have like tighter arcs the flying sections of the game are also notoriously laggy so that's something that has to be get gotten used to if you learn the game If you get close enough to Madden Pooch, she makes that noise and it's pretty hilarious. And then there's one more phase of the flying lesson after this. Ready for a tough as before on my whistle. This last one can be tough, but overall it's not too bad. The, the hitboxes on the rings are fairly generous. Oh, that was a little rough. Nope, I missed a ring. It can be really bad to miss a ring because it's a lot of time to turn around and uh, get it. Well done. If you run out of time, it's generally not bad. Uh, you end up passing the class anyway, but obviously it's better to just finish it out. Here's a pretty good dialogue skip. Hi, Harry. No, I am not. Hello, Harry. She's wrong. All right, so the next up is the first class. There are four classes throughout the entire game, but we skip two of them in any percent. So this is one of the only two that you'll be seeing. So 
some reason Ron's just silent there. So this is the beginning of getting to class. Uh, there's this kid here who tells you how to get to class and you can just completely ignore him and walk around him. Alright, so Hogwarts is a very interesting school. To get to class, you have to pass through these obstacle courses. Um, not really sure who designed that in the curriculum, but here we are. Uh, something I've noted these birdie bots beans. Uh, collecting all of a certain color of them gives you certain rewards. Uh, most of them don't actually contribute anything to the game's completion, though, so in both any percent and 100%, you don't collect most of them. Alright, so learning spells is basically Simon Says. You just do exactly the button combination it tells you to. That was good. Excellent. Perfect. Well done, Potter. Great. All right, so we have learned Wingardium Leviosa, so now we can levitate things. Now, let's a charm. Try levit. Press the tr Wingardium Leviosa. And that's charms. Alright, so now we're gonna start heading outside of the castle. We're about to get this letter from Hedwig, or for, from Hedwig, that is from Hagrid, asking to meet him outside. So we're gonna head out there. And coming up is actually the first boss fight in the run. So. So, uh, here's Malfoy, and he's blocking the enter the exit out of the castle, because somehow, uh, an 11-year-old has the jurisdiction to prevent you from entering or exiting the castle. And also, for some reason, putting these hourglasses back on their pillars, uh, opens the door. So, here's the first boss fight. Also, this door's gonna completely, like, beat the hell out of Malfoy's back, which is pretty great. So now Malfoy's angry at you. So he's gonna throw what are called wizard crackers at you and you have to throw him back. Because for some reason you just can't flip into him. Um, so this fight has setups that make it consistent. And the key is that you want to wait for Malfoy to prepare throwing some another firecracker before you throw one back at him. If you throw too early he'll completely dodge it. So the p positions I'm standing in uh, specifically are to make sure, like, to manipulate Malfoy into being where I want him to be. So the second phase, he has crab, and now Malfoy's starting to think he's super wizard crackers. And I can't pick those up, because they explode immediately, so I have to wait for crab to throw a smaller one before I can hit him. Alright, that was a pretty good second phase. Alright, so the third phase is pretty tricky, because now you have to deal with crab and goyle. I'm not gonna get this, so I'm not gonna bother with the fast recycle. Alright, I missed that one. Alright, this is going pretty bad. Alright, that's fine. Lost a lot of time on that last phase. Alright, so now we have to watch this really long cutscene of them running upstairs and then Crab is an idiot and runs in the opposite direction before realizing uh, exactly what he just did. And then finally we get to leave the castle. And immediately upon leaving it, we get another unskippable cutscene. Meanwhile, the House Point hourglasses are slowly... Filled. So this is the first of three House Point hourglass cutscenes we see. Uh, they're... Uh, you skip a couple of them, but the ones that are in the run are just unavoidable. Ravenclaw. Um, 
one of the nice things about this run is that there is actually a lot of downtime. So it's a pretty chill run to actually do, and it's also pretty chill to watch. But it has a bunch of small things, along with a couple of big things that will be coming up in this next section, uh, that make it pretty interesting to watch. Gryffindor are in the lead on house points. Will Slytherin hold the house cup for a seventh consecutive year? So after that, there's still another cutscene where Harry walks outside, and you know he, he loves the scenery. You know he never really was allowed outside before, and this is uh the legendary PS1 Hagrid. You'll need to come roam your. So he's telling you to come to his hut after Herbology class. So this is the second and last class we'll be doing in the run. So now we're going to learn Incendio, and it's again more Simon Says or whatever. That was good. Excellent. Perfect. Most. That was good. Excellent. And that is the last of the lessons we'll be doing. Well done. All right. Now so the trick you can do here called Fast Incendio. I think I'll I'll show it off before I I try to explain it. Use your hit the correct Incendio. Oh, I got it. Okay, so the way it works is that you have to hit the correct button when it's in the ring, and. You can actually buffer two inputs uh, into the ring uh, just to get faster inputs like that. All right, so that is like the last part of the game that's actually done properly. From this point on, we're actually going to completely sequence break the game and play it basically completely out of order until the end. So if you play this game casually, then nothing's going to look right from this point on. I used to have a puffs game. And there's Ron giving the most important uh, piece of uh, lore in the Harry Potter universe. He used to have a puff skin. All right, so this is a really neat skip coming up called Fire Seed Skip. There you are, Harry. So Harry's, or Hagrid is asking you to get these fire seeds that he needs from past the past the gate, but uh, we don't want to do that. So we're gonna I'm just gonna ignore him and do this. So this is actually a little tricky, so I'm gonna try and focus for it. One more part. Come on, come on. Oh, okay, that's annoying. All right, we'll try it again. This trick's not difficult, but it, there's a lot of steps to it, so it's pretty easy to mess up. I'll explain it when I'm done. Alright. 
All right, there we go. That was pretty bad, but it just happens sometimes. All right, so the way that works is that, like, when you stand a specific way, Harry can kind of clip into the scenery, and with, like, pause buffering, uh, you can clip into the scenery enough that you can climb up the trees and jump over that fence. And you're not supposed to be able to do that until... Um, way after the fire seeds section. And the fire seed section is very long. So, it saves, like, upwards of, like, five to six minutes to do that skip. So, this is actually the second Malfoy fight, and you basically just chase him on his broom, because he stole Neville's Remember All. Also, uh, you have to dodge Malfoy's bludgers, because apparently Malfoy's so rich, he just has an infinite repository of bludgers to throw at people. Yeah. So the fire seed skip is one of the first of two really big skips in the run. Um, the thing that makes it a little terrifying, aside from the fact that there's a lot of steps to it because of all the pause buffering, is that you actually have to do it twice in the run, so we will be seeing that again. But it does save a lot of time, so it's very much worth learning. Alright, that wasn't a terrible knock, boy. Alright, so this is uh, the what I call the Quidditch section of the game. Uh, basically, this is going to be straight like eight and a half minutes of Quidditch. So it's another bit of like a, a downtime segment of the run. This entire middle section is pretty relaxed compared to a lot of the end game. And a lot of the early game. Wow, I just wanted... Everyone's as soon as I welcome the Quidditch watcher, Gryffindor, remember. Here comes Potter. of gold is that the snitch potter's seen the snitch yeah all right so quidditch is just like the flying lessons you have to follow the snitch through these rings and when you go through enough rings you're able to catch it uh these are by far the laggiest section of the game i think that there's just so much on the screen that the, there's no way the the playstation can handle it also, you get to hear some wonderful color commentary by uh, Lee Jordan. And then, after a certain point, you start ha racing against uh, the Hufflepuff Seeker, who doesn't actually do anything. He's just kind of there. He hits you if you get close to him, but he just like pushes you out of the way. And that's the first footage. Okay, so... Right after the quiz match, we meet Professor Snape. And he confiscates this book that you got from Hagrid, except you didn't actually get it from Hagrid. As soon as hey, the map shows. I wonder if it. So Snape had a sloth brain that the is his was stolen, 
and he thinks you did it, so he tells you to find it, or no one's gonna have class, and everyone's gonna fail, because that's some good teaching. So we're here to find the Sloth Brain. We're actually not gonna do that yet. So we're actually gonna save the game. And then we're gonna quit. And you can actually hold start and select to like automatically go back to the menu, which just saves a little time. And then we're gonna reload the file. And now that we've done Quidditch, we unlock this free play Quidditch mode. And we're actually gonna do this. And this seems really weird, but uh, it'll all make sense uh, very soon. So we actually have to we have to play against Hufflepuff again. A glint of gold. Is that the snitch? Potter's seen the snitch. And then th this is really more of the same, so there isn't too much to say about this. There's a quick snitch catch at the end that you can try for and it saves a little bit of time. I'll go for it to see if I can get it. I, I missed it. All right. It doesn't actually lose any time to fail it. It just you don't get the any time save for messing it up. All right. So now we have to do another, one more Quidditch match, this time against Ravenclaw. And again, this is more of the same. This is a little bit harder, just because the snitch moves a bit more erratically and it feels like a little laggier than normal. Uh, but otherwise, it is again more of the same. Uh, so you're probably really confused as to why I'm doing this. Um, I'll explain it after this, but... Something to keep in mind is that this game is more or less split into, I want to say, five chunks. There's the opening, which is the Charms Corridor, and then there's the Castle Grounds. And then there's the Dungeons, and then there's the Upper Castle, and then um, there's a little bit of, like, of a detour in the middle of the game. And then... There's the end game, which is just the, uh, you know, the third floor corridor or the trap door. So, so it's not really four parts. It's like you know, five or five or six segments of this game. So uh, keep that in mind. I would say. The lag makes it really hard to control the broom sometimes, and then combined with the other seeker just getting in your way, it can be pretty annoying to actually follow this niche properly. Alright, one more ring should be good.
All right. So there's a Ravenclaw Quidditch match in the story mode, but because of an oversight in the game's programming, if you do the free play Ravenclaw Quidditch match, um, and then you come back, the game thinks you have progressed to that point. So now Hagrid is here, and he tells you that uh, Dragon or Norbert, that dragon that we didn't hatch, uh, is sick, and you have to go to Diagon Alley to get uh, medicine for him. This doesn't happen normally until much later in the game. Um, and this basically cuts out the majority of the dungeons and the majority of the upper castle. And combined with Fire Seed Skip that cuts out the majority of the castle grounds, you basically cut out a good 40 to 50% of the game. And both of them combined uh, save actually upwards to like half an hour on the run. Um, there's an any percent no major skips category, and the current record for it is a 139 compared to this game's record of uh, 113. So that, that's just like perspective of how much those two skips together save. And the Quidditch abuse is really where most of the sequence breaks come because there are some things you do have to still do in the dungeons and the upper castle to actually progress properly in the story. So we will end up doing them much later in the game than you are supposed to. But basically, the Quidditch abuse skips the entire middle section of the game. And now we are in Gringotts, and uh, this is uh, the section's an adventure. It's not really difficult, but it's annoying. So in order to get to the vaults to get the money for the medicine, you have to collect this paperwork. And uh, for some reason... The floor is really slippery because that stupid goblin to the left over there just spent his entire life waxing the entire floor to the point where it's basically an ice rink. So you can lose a lot of time trying to pick up the paperwork just because it's so difficult to actually control Harry. Alright. So this is one of three Gringotts minigames. These are very long and they are auto-scrollers and you can't do anything to skip them. You just have to go through them. Thankfully they're pretty easy. Um, if you play this game casually... You might remember this actually being pretty difficult. Um, first time experiencing it, it can be very rough. But the basic gist is that you have to collect enough coins to fill up this bar on the top right three times. And if you get if you hit these uh, these wooden uh, planks, then you lose coins. All right. So I'm actually going to show off something here. So these are what are called bonus gems, and. If you collect every bonus gem, you're actually awarded a witch, a famous witch or wizard card. But it is slower to collect that card, so in any percent, you do not want to collect all of them. Uh, in 100%, you actually do need to collect all of them because you need every wizard card. However, um, if you miss even one, you have to go through the entire thing again. Uh, so in 100%, this entire Gringotts section is notoriously really brutal. It's not really hard, but it's very unforgiving, and it's a major turnoff for a lot of people who would otherwise run 100%. Um, it's like the one blemish on the category. Any percent, thankfully, Gringotts isn't hard. It's just really long and kind of boring, so there really isn't too much to say here. Like, I could hold X right here and still win. So I'm actually just going to spin. You can also just spin. Uh, if you suffer from dizziness or motion sickness, I would not recommend looking at the screen right now. But you, you can just straight up do this, and Harry will still pass. Something you also have to make sure not to do is accidentally say, would you like to try again? Because if you do, you have to sit through the entire minigame again. Alright, so that was Kanut. That's the first of three. Next is Sickle. So this is, again, more paperwork collecting. This is like the most like dull part of the run. It is straight up 15 and a half minutes of paperwork collecting and auto scroller. And it's it's not the best part of the run, admittedly. But everything after it kind of makes up for it because the end game of this run is pretty crazy. Though. It's pretty tense. So once you get back past all of this, it's pretty fine. Actually, I'm... A little wrong. The Gringotts section is only maybe about 10 minutes. Uh, 
but there's a handful of mini games afterwards that are not terribly interesting oh, so it? the entire diagon alley oh, section is the dullest part of the run remember sweet good luck and as far as we know there isn't a way to skip it all right so this is sickle again there really isn't too much with this just collect enough coins to fill the bar up three times And that's sickle, so there will be one more Gringot section after this. Kenning up this slippery hill is actually really annoying. So this is the last section, and I consider this the most annoying pa uh, paperwork to do, just because it's a lot of weaving around corners. So coming up to the last uh, Gringotts minigame, this one is probably the most terrifying one in terms of collecting enough coins. Uh, there's a lot more of the wooden pegs that can steal coins from you if you hit them, so... in 100% uh, muscle memory with collecting the bonus gems. Yeah. Basically, the only way you can lose time in these minigames is just by not collecting enough coins, but as long as you memorize the patterns, it's really not difficult getting all of them.
then again from here you could just like hold X or just like do nothing or just spin the camera like this and you'll still just like pass at this point because there's nothing else that can take coins from you from this point also Harry's having like the time of his life on this well done, Mr. Po you can return. and that is uh the end of the Gringotts minigames, all that's left in Gringotts is getting out of it. So I actually did a cutscene skip at the beginning of this that I didn't even mention, where I walked around the left side to avoid talking to a goblin. I'm gonna do something again here. So I'm gonna... I'm not, immediately coming here, I'm just gonna walk... And I missed it, because the slippery floors are really annoying like that. It only saves like a couple seconds to do it, so... Not even, it might even just be like one second. So now that we have the coins to buy the ingredients for Norbert's medicine now we actually have to get the ingredients and uh, this first one is notoriously RNG heavy so you have to find the toad and hit it three times to get war the toad wars from it all right so I'm looking for the toad and I didn't see one of the boxes downstairs shake so I'm assuming he's up here but I've been wrong before I thought I heard him. Nope, he's not down here. You have to be careful because if you break too many of them, then uh Where is he? Huh. This is terrible. Oh, there he is. But yeah. Basically where the toad ends up is random, but if he's on the top floor, he will never uh immediately be on the uh second floor again. It looks like he's on the top floor again. Yep. Nope. Where is he? There he is. Alright, that was particularly bad, Toad RNG. But yeah. That was one of the worst cases of it I've seen in quite a while. Alright, so that's the first mini game. Second mini game, I want to say hopefully won't go as bad, but this one is also notoriously pretty awful. So this is uh, the peacock mini game. So all of Vander has this peacock, and you have to run up to it and pluck three feathers from it. But you can't use your wand on it because apparently that's incredibly dangerous. Because peacocks are the most powerful being to ever exist. Um, so you can kind of, like kind of anticipate where the peacock is going, but even then it, it moves pretty erratically. That's the first feather. You have to do this three times, and the peacock moves really quickly, which is, makes it kind of annoying to get all the feathers. But thankfully, that one went well. Also, anybody who's played the PC version of this game might notice that as being the gnome song uh, that plays when you fight gnomes in the PC version. Uh, that was an incredibly good peacock, so that kind of made up for the toad being terrible. Alright, so there's one more mini game, and thankfully this one is completely easy. There's no RNG involved whatsoever, and it's basically just an auto scroller, which is a nice trade off from the other two mini games that can really lose you a lot of time. Excellent. My eagle, his treats are use the ones he's fed. Alright, so you need to get a feather from this eagle owl in the center. And uh, to pluck the feather, you have to make him fall asleep by feeding him three peanuts. And I don't know about you guys, but when I eat three peanuts, I get really tired. So. Yeah. The key to this one, because the owls that are flying around can eat the peanuts if you're not careful, and that does lose a little bit of time. Just like that. <laughs> uh, so that was great. That is 100% my fault, though. Like, if you do this properly, that should never happen. As long as you stay, like, low to the ground, the owls will never eat the peanuts. But you have to lift it over the, uh, the little counter there at first. And that owl just happened to come by as I did it. But that is entirely, like, timing on my part. So, yeah. <laughs> that happened. Probably, like... I want to say... 
maybe five to ten seconds for having to do that again. And then you can again avoid talking to uh, the shopkeeper by just running over here. And yeah, it was about ten seconds. So that's the end of Diagon Alley. Well done. All right. So now Hagrid's gonna give the he's gonna give the dragon tonic to Norbit. And we've done it. Oh, I'm glad they want to go. So coming up is another unskippable cutscene. This is there's storybook cutscenes throughout the entire game, and uh, you skip one of them in the run. So this is supposed to be the third one, but it's actually the second one in the run. Eventually, after much coaxing, Hagrid agreed. That night, Harry carried Norbert up to the tallest tower. So the next section is the Forbidden Forest, and there's actually a lot of cool stuff that happens in this area. So there's definitely some interesting stuff in the run from this point on. It's just getting through that 15-minute section of like Diagon Alley, along with like the eight-minute quiz section. So it's like a good like 20 minutes of downtime in the middle of the run, which is really nice when you're running it. But, like, from a viewer perspective, it's honestly pretty dull. But once you get to this part, the run becomes pretty interesting. That split up. It should be careful. I better go if I'm not... So basically, you have to follow the trail of the unicorn blood to find the unicorn that has been severely wounded. Alright, so... Incendio! Wow, I messed up really badly. I attempted to do fast incendio, but I didn't get it. So you don't actually have to fully charge Flipendos, you can do like mostly charged ones and it has the same effect. And that's a little bit of just, again, skipping the like climb mapping animation by just jumping onto the uh, log instead. Alright. And you just completely ignore these trolls. Alright, so I'm going to attempt something called Bridge Skip. Uh, if you get this right, it saves like 12 seconds. Uh, so I'm going to try it once. If I don't get it, I'll just... Uh, I'll just burn the, the shrubs. Alright. Yeah, I didn't get it. Okay, we'll just... Yeah. It's not huge. It's just that if you jump properly, you can burn these... Or you can... Skip this incendio. And it saves like a little bit of time, but it's not super huge, so it's not worth like going for constantly unless you're at top level. So, so I'm actually gonna avoid this chocolate frog. Chocolate frogs are health. I didn't mention that because it hasn't really come up. It's pretty hard to die in this game. Um, but I actually want to be at like not high health for the section after this. So I'm going to intentionally damage abuse in a lot of spots. Alright. So those are actually... Those giant tortoises are actually called fire crabs for some reason. I couldn't tell you why. Because they're very blatantly tortoises. But you have to hit them three times as they're attacking you. And then they open the path to the next area. And there's two of them you have to fight. So I'm actually going to play my health a little bit safe, just for the sake of, you know, marathon safety. Normally I would want to leave the Forbidden Forest with about half health, but I'll leave like a, with a little bit more than half here. Alright, so we're coming up to the end of the Forbidden Forest. I see you. There's summit. So the, there's a nice little incendio skip you can do here. Yeah. Again, if you walk into a wall in a certain way, uh, Harry actually clips into the scenery. And at a certain point, Harry will jump and the game will proxy you and throw you up to the top of the uh, hill. And it just skips doing that entire incendio. It's pretty easy to do and it's a pretty nice time save. Also, that's the greatest cutscene ever. Just 
constantly panning in on Harry and then the dark figure constantly and then Harry just passes out. Harry was rescued in the nick of time by the centaur Firenze and rode on his back to safety. Firenze explained the unicorn blood had the power to keep someone alive who was an inch from death. Harry realized that the hooded figure he'd seen in the clearing was none other than he who must not be named. Lord Voldemort. Right. So, this is the last we're going to see of Hagrid, sadly. And he's going to give you the flute, which will be very useful soon. Some, in fact, try it out on... So basically, you just have to hit the buttons in the correct order to make the hit make the animal fall asleep, and you can hit them really quickly. But you have to be careful because if you mess it up, then the creature actually wakes back up. So. I've been doing some reading about Nicholas Flamel, the wizard that Hagrid mentioned. He's the creator. So this is the start of the end game, but before we do anything, we actually have to do Fire Seed Skip again. So. This is uh, a pretty tense part if you're on like PB pace because you can just like throw the run right here pretty late into it. So, or that didn't feel like a good setup. Let's try that again. All right. Alright, it went, it went good the first time, that time. Alright, so the reason we have to do the fire sea skip again is because that sloth brain that we were supposed to get the Snape uh, earlier in the run before the Quidditch abuse, uh, you actually need that to access the dungeons, and you need to access the dungeons to access the upper castle, and the end game is in the upper castle. So you actually do have to do all of this. Which is the one downside of the Quidditch abuse, but... Overall, it's not too bad. So we're going to do something called Sloth Brain Skip. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to pull this lever and then completely run around. And then uh, the Sloth Brain's on the other side of this, uh, you know, like, little hedge. But you can line up the camera properly and you should be able to just, like... Uh, well, I did it wrong, so uh, let's try it again. There we go. You kind of, kind of just like clip up to the scenery like that. When done right, it saves maybe like 40 seconds because it, it cuts out an entire room and all this backtracking. And then I'm going to do an, another cutscene skip here. If you hug like the left side right here, uh, it skips this scene where uh, Hedwood comes by and drops a letter from Hermione. Alright. So, one nice thing about uh, doing Sloth Brain this late into the run is that normally upon exiting Hagrid's hut after he gives you the flute, you would have to run all the way through the castle grounds back to the castle. But when you do Sloth Brain, the game automatically puts you back to the entrance of the castle. So that's a just a nice little thing about having Sloth Brain this late in the run is that it skips all that movement. are in the lead on The race for the house is heating up. Alright, so coming up is the dungeons. Let's go and give Snape. We'll be in big Ah, so well. So you give Snape the soft brain and you watch him slowly, slowly walk away.
So another thing the Quidditch abuse does is that when you skip to this point in the game, the game thinks you have everything that you would have at that point. So we have the last two spells that we didn't learn because the game thinks we should have them by now. So. To the left and right there are two uh, cutscenes or classrooms. So there's Hermione on the left and there's also Hermione on the right. That's just kind of a little fun glitch of the Quidditch abuse. Uh, so this is a spell we were supposed to learn. And it just creates these platforms that you can walk on. Before the Quidditch abuse was found, there was actually a skip that let you not do it. And you just jump from that section over there to this area. And it was notoriously awful. So the Quidditch abuse was a huge blessing for many reasons. Along with just making the run faster. It just got rid of that. So this section is called Four Eyes. So that door over there that nearly had its neck was next to is blocked off by these four like spinning eyeball curses or whatever. And you have to travel through this area to kill all of the curses in order to escape. And the reason you have to do this is that uh, killing all the four eyes is how you unlock the upper castle. So. Yeah. And the key to this area is just the f knowing the fastest route to get to each eye. Alright, so first eye here is the green eye. Coming up is more of these tortoises. I'm going to intentionally damage views through them because it's faster. And that's the second eye. Might have to be a little bit careful here. Yeah, so hopefully I don't take another damage view, so that could be bad. Alright, that's fine. It's a good thing I played the Forbidden Forest a little safe. That's Peeves, by the way. I skipped the dialogue where he tells you that. Peeves is a character in the book that isn't in the movies. So, uh, I'd be understanding if there are some people who didn't read the books who had no idea who that character is. Uh, he's pretty cool and you have a race with him in the middle of the game, but you skip it. So, hopefully if I get this right, I can do a little cutscene skip here with this red eye. I think I got it. Yep, there it is. So basically the cutscene of the eye exploding overlaps with the cutscene of Harry opening the door and then it just saves like you know five seconds or so. Alright, so we're coming up to the final eye. And in this room there's something called Night Skip. Where uh, you're supposed to have to fight off this knight, which I'm going to do. Um, but you can actually jump around the knight with proper spacing. But if you do it wrong, it, it saves like probably like five seconds if you do it right. But if you do it wrong, you lose a lot of time because you fall down and you take damage, you can die, and it's just a lot safer to do the, do fight the knight normally, unless you're at like top level, the, the time it saves is not super vital. Alright, so this is actually going to be the only instance of a death abuse in the entire run. Um, so, if you die in this area... It takes you back to the beginning, but all the eyes that you have already killed are still dead. So you just death abuse after the last eye, and you can just do that. And that is entirely why uh, the blue eye is saved for last, because it is right in front of a pit. It is also ironically in front of a bunch of chocolate frogs, so you kind of have to weave around them. And that is the dungeon, so the rest of this is just going to be uh, getting out of the dungeon. Alright. I'm gonna read.
reset my capture card because the audio is desyncing a little bit. All right, so that's the entrance to the upper castle. So we have to go back up towards the uh, first area of the game to reach it. So the next section that's going to happen is the Forbidden Corridor. Uh, this section is supposed to happen in the middle of the run, but because of the sequence break we de breaking we did with Quidditch Abuse, uh, we are now doing it right before the end of the run. Uh, the Dungeons with the Four Eyes is also supposed to be in the middle of the run, so you can see how much the Quidditch Abuse just completely sequence breaks this game. So this is the last spell, it's Abbey Force. It's basically Incendio, but a lot easier. You can like spin the camera with the table and it saves a little bit of time on less lag. I'm also on the wrong door. You want to go through this door. So this is a stealth section. You use the invisibility cloak to get around Mr. Filch. This is not a really hard section, but it is a scary one because if you get caught you get sent back to the very beginning and it's a pretty big time loss my favorite part is if you skip the dialogue there it sounds like Phil says Dumbledore has ordered that nose all right so so basically the, there's an invisibility cloak and you just grab it and you're temporarily invisible and then you have to grab the key up here you can actually do this room cloakless and it saves like a second, but it's also scary as hell, so I don't do it. Alright, so up here is a cutscene. Where Snape tells Filch that he has something special planned for anyone. I see. But we have there is something we can't let now me see that you do mr filch i have something special planned for anyone who all right so this next room also has a cloakless strat i will be going for it because not only is it very easy it is also much faster than actually grabbing the cloak So I need to wait for Mrs. Norris, the cat, to completely turn around. She's going to walk to the end of this wooden plank and then turn around. If I jump on this platform at any point before that, she will see me and I will get caught. So now that she's turned around, I can just jump here. The cloak is right on the end of that plank and that takes forever, so you just do this instead. And neither of them see you. And it's just so much faster and it's a lot easier. This next room is probably the hardest one of the stealth rooms. So, let's see if I can get it. The window for how long this uh, cloak lasts is pretty tight in this room. So if you make a mistake, you might just end up having to wait for the cloak to respawn, but that went really well. Alright, and then this last room is pretty easy. Something of note is that I'm going to enter this room and then I'm going to immediately run all the way to this wall to the right. If you don't do that, uh, you actually reach the bookcase before Filch turns around and he sees you. So it's actually very important that you touch that wall before you attempt to go for the uh, bookcase with the cloak. And that's the end of the Forbidden Corridor. And then you can skip the dialogue with Ron and Hermione there. And there we go. Meanwhile, the this is the last house point hourglass cutscene. And now we are in the end game. Ravenclaw. Hufflepuff. Slytherin. Gryffindor. Slytherin are in the lead on house points. 
The race for the House Cup is heating up. So this is fluffy, and this model is the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. And basically, you have to put all three dogs' heads to sleep while avoiding his attacks like that. Also, note in the top right corner, we never actually gave Snape the sloth brain. Oh, yep. Yeah. I was too slow. So that wasn't too bad of a fluffy. Alright, so the next section is the Devil's Snare. So you have to kill all these tentacles in the order that they become bright green. I'm so glad we try and figure try not to get And then here you just use a crosshair. Oh, well I missed. And then after this last one you kinda come up over here. And you have to fight this big the, the main vine here. And if you if you properly time mostly charge knockback jinxes, then you can just get it locked into like hit stun like this and then you just never have to actually fight it. Oh perfect. You can do fast incendio here, but it's really really laggy and usually not worth going for. And that's double snare. Time to beat your good luck, Harry. All right, so this is the winged key section. It's basically Quidditch again. Uh, not really too much to it otherwise. One more ring, and then we should be good to catch it. And yeah, that was basically all there is to this. Alright, so coming up next is chess. Actually, do a bit of like camera manipulation to minimize lag here. Oh, I got stuck on the wall. So, in the 
two seconds that it took for you to follow Ron, he's immediately been knocked down by these chess pieces. Which means Ron's really good at playing chess quickly. So there's three chess boards, and you just have to manipulate the pieces into fighting each other. And there's a set pattern for each that is the fastest way to do it. Also, this is very clearly how each chess work how chess works. Each piece moves one square at a time, and uh, they can team kill each other. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, chess has friendly fire. Yeah. That's the first chessboard. The second chessboard's pattern is very easy. You just start on the left and you make an end shape. And now they left the ante and now there are rooks along with pawns. There is nothing uh, gameplay wise that is affected by this. One more section. Now, along with the rooks and the pawns, there are also now queens. There are three queens for some reason. Though I suppose that there's that rule where if a pawn reaches the other side of the board, uh, it can become any piece, so maybe that's how the black side got two queens. At the same time, though, I don't think the developers of this game knew how to play chess. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. And that is chess. <laughs> Alright, so the next section is the troll section. And for this one... First off, this troll is asleep and waking up and listen to how loudly Hermione yells. And then she was, oh wait, no, I shouldn't do that. So, you have to get all these objects out of the way so the troll doesn't run into them, and the troll like slowly walks to you, so. Alright, I got a slow troll, which is safer, but slower. And you have to be careful, because if the objects are not out of the way and the troll trips on them, then he wakes up. And then if you drop it from too high up, it makes a loud noise and the troll wakes up. And if the troll wakes up, you are automatically dead. There is no outrunning it at all. It's actually a cutscene that the game puts you in that just kills you. So. Again, this is not a particularly terrifying... This is not a particularly hard section, but it is a little scary. So I'm going to attempt another little cutscene skip here. Alright, so again, that was the two cutscenes over riding each other, and it, dropping the chair gives, Harry con gives you control of Harry sooner. Uh, if you mess it up, though, and you drop the chair too early, the troll wakes up and you die. Alright. Looks like you'll have to choose. Did you so this is a uh, follow the cup game with knights. Oh, 
Oh, well that was very nice and I didn't even try to attack me. It doesn't actually matter what you do before this cutscene, it will always just put you right in front of the doorway like that. Alright. So coming up is, uh, what the most notoriously terrifying skip in the run. This is, there's a consistent setup for it now that I'm going to go for, but this has killed many, many runs. And there's a possibility I can mess it up here. But this is called Clody Skip. It was named after the guy who found it. But let's see if I can get this. Alright. Very nice. So the pause buffering strat I did there is completely consistent. But it is a little slower, so a lot of people still go for the older strat where you just kind of eyeball it and wing it that strat is a lot scarier so i just i will go for the consistent strat but that skips an entire uh two waves of fights with knights and then a mini boss fight with a giant knight so it is a huge time save it's like a minute and a half all right so this is the last fight with voldemort and there is a fast strat here that is audio based so i'm going to focus to see if i can get it and it saves about a minute to do it properly So yeah, that entire phase is supposed to be a lot longer, but you can, uh, you can lock Voldemort into that one section and the pillar will constantly respawn and you can just hit him six times really quickly. Um, and the sound cue is his grunt, which is why I was focusing. And when you hit him six times, it starts the next phase. So this phase, you have to get him in front of the mirror and then you have to throw two charged jinxes into the mirror to hit him and then you do the you hit him four times should be the last hit and then this was the last phase and time comes up at the end of this part also because of the clody skip before the audio is completely dished in this fight so when we kill Voldemort he might just like, he'll make a lot of weird like grunts and noises and he might just randomly yell die potter and it's hilarious. It's also why the audio, the music is playing twice. Alright, one more hit after this so time is coming up very soon. And yep. And that is time, and that is Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone on PS1, uh, any percent. A uh, little rough with the uh, with the Fire Seed skip going wrong the first time, but overall that run wasn't too bad. Um, this is a really interesting run. It's a very chill run. It's not like super high, like fast paced, but it is, it's a nice relaxing one to watch. It's very interesting, and there's a bunch of small stuff going on, along with the two major skips. So I think this would be a really cool run to show off at uh, a marathon. So I hope you guys consider it. Um, so yeah, um, I'll let this cutscene roll before I cut off the video. But yeah, um, I hope you guys consider this. I would love to show this off at pace. Nevertheless, Harry. 
If our battles do no more than slow Voldemort's return, with luck he may never regain his power at all. Harry made his way down to the end of the year feast alone that night. The great hall was decked out in green and silver to celebrate Slytherin winning the House Cup. When Harry entered, there was a sudden hush. He took a seat between Ron and Hermione, trying to ignore the stares of the other students. The House Cup, announced Dumbledore, is awarded to the team with the most house points. At the moment, that would seem to be Slytherin. A storm of cheering and stamping broke out from the Slytherin table. However, continued Dumbledore, in recognition of Mr. Harry Potter's pure nerve and outstanding courage, I award Gryffindor 60 points. Harry's table erupted with cheers and applause. The additional point had won the House Cup for Gryffindor. It was the best evening of Harry's life. Better than winning at Quidditch or Christmas or knocking out mountain trolls. He would never, ever forget tonight. Alright, that was Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Uh, thanks for watching, and I hope this gets into the marathon.